Hello, and welcome to Scurf Interviews. This is the second of the seven episode mini series exploring block science, crypto economics, and computer aided governance. In this episode, we have David Sisson, who is a senior engineer at Block Science, and Kelsey Nabin, who is the lead social scientist at Block Science, to provide an introduction to data and measurement in Web3. As part of that, we get into what is measurement, what can we measure, what do we do with what we measure, and how measurement data can inform decisions. Without further ado, here's the interview. Thank you for joining us today, uh, David and Kelsey. It would be great to just start off with some introductions. So David, do you mind jumping in and give us an intro to start? Sure. Um, my name is David Sisson. I work for a company called Block Science, uh, which uh, does uh, analytic, uh, basically modeling work in the, in the uh, distributed ledger field. Um, we work in, 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 in on, on uh, what we call complex systems, cybernetic systems. They've got various names, but but uh, that, that's that's our, our job in a nutshell. Um, my background is uh, started off life uh, as an academic. Um, I'm a biologist by by uh, by education. Uh, got a uh, and a, uh, a neuroscientist by specialization. Uh, I got a, 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 a Bachelor of Science from, from University of Miami and a PhD from University of Delaware. Um, switched over to uh, technology because I liked it better um, about 25 years ago and have been there ever since. My most recent job is, is with, uh, with block science, largely because the crypto field is, is a really interesting one right now. Interesting problems engage me. Thank you, David. Kelsey, do you mind jumping in with an intro? Sure. A, a complex field, to say the least. I also uh, am with Block Science. I head up the governance research team, uh, but I'm a social scientist and an ethnographer. So really, uh, my place, I guess, in today's topic is thinking about uh, some of the social dynamics of uh, the sort of engineering uh, processes and, and challenges that we uh, navigate. Uh, and in the rest of uh, my life, I'm uh, currently doing my PhD, talking about academic pathways. Uh, but I'm really, yeah, grateful to be with Block Science as well, which is kind of like the uh, primary research and then the application and iteration of um, of those ideas. Great. Thank you both for the intro. And before kind of delving into uh, measurement and what we specifically mean by that, I'd actually like to maybe zoom in a little more on your intro, David, and to ask the question around, uh, given your background sort of in biology and neuroscience and now transitioning here, it'd be interesting uh, to hear a little more about the journey that you took, especially in the context of, uh, of measurement and data and the conversation we're about to be getting into and sort of the lenses that your own uh, background lets you kind of wear and bring to the box science table, so to say. As a, a science, a scientist, you're a physical scientist, you're any scientist, you're, your bread and butter is measurement. Um, you go out and observe something um, and you write down what it is you observed. And that's, that's, that's effectively a measurement. Um, and then you can, you can uh, make, um, um, you know, predictions, estimates, theories, whatever you want based on that. But that, that's sort of the, the baseline. Um, I got interested in computers because um, I hate writing stuff down. And computers are really good at writing stuff down. And fortunately, uh, when I was at the University of Miami, um, they were, um, had the uh, hurricane weather group. Uh, right there on campus, and there was a there was a computer available um, for that purpose. It was a big big mainframe, uh, and so I was able to uh, to take a couple of cor courses in computer programming there, and use that in my in my studies to to make um, you know calculating uh, standard deviations, means whatever easier. Um, I went on to uh, to effectively instrument my lab. Uh, while working on my PhD work uh, to, a, to a digital equipment corporation micro uh, mini computer. And then the microcomputer revolution hit. Um, and I, I helped uh, uh, various labs in, in the, in the uh, universities that I've worked with uh, instrument themselves. 
And then, as I said, I got more interested in the instrumentation pro process than I did in the in the experimentation process. So I moved out into uh, into scientific and engineering computing, and then from there into just general business computing, where I got a, an interest in uh, database systems, data modeling, and, and uh, into data engineering and data science when when they became things uh, from there. And so it would be great to uh, to then kick off with, uh, you know, the focus of today's interview and this discussion today is sort of an intro to data and measurement in Web3. So maybe we can define the term. What are we talking about when we say measurement in the first place? From my perspective, me me as I said, measurement is is simply what you what uh, you write down what you observe, you record what you reserve, observe. Um, uh, you can you can uh, have a. Um, you know, a thermometer. Um, it can be an old fashioned thermometer that's just, you know, mercury in a tube. You read the height of the mercury, you write down what the degrees are. It can be, you know, a digital now, you can, the computer, uh, you can you can read the information from the thermometer directly into a computer. Um, those are the sorts of things I call measurement. But then I'm from a physical science background. Um, Kelsey from a, from a what I would call social science background has a has a broader much broader um, view of that, um, largely because the the groups that are the what she's studying are people, and you can ask people questions and get answers. So that's measurement as well from my perspective. You know, like part of each of our roles within block science is that. You know, we, we talked about looking at complex systems, but they're complex socio-technical systems. So we want to look at the social dynamics and the technical dynamics. And I wonder if an appropriate starting point might just be uh, for you to outline, you know, some of the cybernetic principles that some of our approach to our work is are, is kind of grounded in. And then I'd love to talk about kind of second order cybernetics from that point and, and how the anthropology comes into it from there. Officially, cybernetics is the science of control and communication. Um, in our in our uh, definition of it, it's really the study of, of complex systems, and and by complex systems, I mean sort of systems of systems, um, with probably a little autonomy thrown in for good measure. Um, so in 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 that in that in that case, um, you're, we're talking about control loops. Um, we're, we we're talking about something that's able to um, sense the environment around it and then activate or, or act interact with the environment around it. Um, and so based on the what the measurements that come off of a sensor, um, a control mechanism can decide what kind of interaction um, the mechanisms act, actuators can perform should perform in the uh, in the environment. Um, and so that that becomes anything from a relatively simple machine, uh, you know, sort of a, a robot uh, being being uh, given instructions for how it can move itself around a maze, or it could be something as as complicated as a um, organization of people or a, a, any kind of so society of people and how that society is governed. That's exactly right. So when we're talking about you know, the control of a system, the word control there is kind of synonymous with the idea of governance. And it comes from this Greek word, Kubernetes, which is like steering or steering the system. Forgive my pronunciation of that. It may be very incorrect, but I have read it. Uh, but under, you know, kind of starting to look at the components of, you know, the decentralized systems or decentralized, quote unquote, autonomous organizations that we all might be more familiar with and breaking these down into these kind of components that are uh, familiar and repeatable in the sense of um, this broad field of cybernetics and, and this way of thinking about systems. Uh, it kind of gives us something to grasp onto and, you know, some of the concepts that David mentioned here are, you know, senses. So what, you know, what are you gathering you know, what's what's doing the data gathering or doing the measuring and then, you know, how this connects to actuators or kind of action in the system towards that, you know, broad purpose of steering it. And so, you know, back to that broader framing that I would come to this kind of project with as a social scientist, 
um, the idea of second order cybernetics came out of, you know, early anthropologists in this field it was, as it was emerging, saying that the system designer is actually part of the system. So you can't abstract the designer out, like the engineer out or whatever, and pretend that they're just like this objective observer, but they're actually part of the system that they're, you know, designing or steering or, you know, making decisions about measurement parameters, centers, actuators, so on. And so uh, you get second order cybernetics, which kind of has a an awareness of the designer as part of the system and a kind of subjective one of that. And so that's where you can get this much kind of broader understanding of, you know, not only like what is being measured in the system, but why, what were the intentions of the people making the system? What were the requirements they were designing for? What were their assumptions and so on? And that's how uh, I guess both of our fields kind of interact uh, here when we, you know, come to, to working as, as a team. Uh, but I guess on that, uh, David, you had a really interesting um, presentation that you shared with some of the team fairly recently around the idea of data. And I think that's uh, another one of these, you know, kind of fundamental, we all know, but we don't think about, you know, what this kind of concept means and maybe something to help us um, orient in our discussion of kind of measurement and communication. This is a, a diagram from a from a uh, sort of rift on from a, a fellow who who uh, uh, um, is is one of the founders of the idea of second order cybernetics, uh, Stafford Beers. Um, Kelsey, let me know if I got his name right. And um, basically, in this are some of the ideas that that, that Kelsey was 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 talking about. So this is a compl complex system. It's a, it's a system of systems. And it has um, a portion of it that, that is designed to, to deliver something. So we're, we're going to call that operations. And it has a portion of, of it to make decisions. And we're going to call that um, governance. But the key thing to, to, to see here is that the, the whole design is, is, is very fractally oriented. Um, within operations, there are localized elements of governance. Um, and within um, sort of the, the, the operation system as a whole, there are, you know, there's the, the, the operation, operations management group and the actual operations group. And then a given uh, sort of operation of an organization, there can be many parts. Um, an, a set of operations um, designed around um, acquiring materials uh, to be used for producing whatever the output of this operation is. So acquisition and production can be said what's going on here. In order for this to work nicely, um, you have to have coordination between these two groups. And that's part of the job of, of governance. And so that's where we get into this, this bottom level of governance delivery and, and being able to communicate, uh, coordinate the, the operations and the, uh, the different operations team. Make sure that not too much is ordered for what the, what the capacity for, for output is. Make sure that the output capacity to deliver um, is, is uh, um, in, in line with what the market can bear. Those, those sorts of things. Um, and then also put up in this governance area or uh, sort of a development group. They have twofold responsibility. One is to uh, make sure that the, that the, that the um, uh, organization is itself is, is ready for the future. Um, its products are aligned with what people thinks people will need. In order to get that information, there's also a communications path not shown because the environment isn't shown in this diagram uh, between development and the outside world. They, they have to go ask people, what do you want? You know, what are we doing well? What are we doing poorly? That sort of thing. And then finally, there's this upper level policy group um, that's deciding where, where, the, where the ship is going to sail. Um, get, gets into the, the, the Kubernetes uh, metaphor that, that, uh, that Kelsey mentioned. Uh, somebody's got to make the decisions about about destination. 
this is actually first order cybernetics here. The missing piece, which is effectively the, the background of this diagram, is the environment in which this particular operation is working. So the, 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 the idea that this organization in and of itself is part of the environment in which it works is effectively the, the addition that second order cybernetics brings to the, brings to the table. I just want to say on that, you know, this is uh, David's redraw because part of what he does is diagramming, which is not a skill that I have, of what is called the viable system model. And so Beer wrote this in uh, 1972 uh, in a book called The Brain of the Firm. And that, you know, that irony of David saying that he comes from biology and kind of a neuroscience background. But it was thinking about, you know, how do you make a viable system that is fully functional but as autonomous as possible so how do you have those operational units down the bottom being able to have you know operational autonomy while still working as a you know cohesive whole uh, or called you know they call it kind of harmonization in that text the key tenets of biology is is the the idea of evolution um, survival of the fittest and that kind of thing. There's competition. So this organization doesn't work in a vacuum. It, it, it works on, on, you know, alongside other organizations, some of which are, it, it is cooperative with, some of it which it is competitive with, and some of which it's both. Um, so under those circumstances, um, you, you need to get this organization tuned properly in order to be both effective and efficient. Because if somebody can be as equally as effective and more efficient, you'll get outcompeted. Or if somebody can be more effective, they can be a little less efficient and they can still beat you. So, so the idea that, that Beers has is sort of, these are the, the, the communications channels that are key in order to effectively manage what are, um, semi-autonomous or autonomous could be truly autonomous groups. Uh, in order to be effective and efficient, these operations teams need to be empowered to make their own decisions because they know their systems better than anybody else. Um, if you wait for this, this, you know, the, the, the Ubermensch up here to tell you what to do, it may be too late. Um, um, so, that you know, th th this is a good balance of effectiveness and efficiency. Um, in that, in that, you have operations teams that can basically do their job, and and governance that has the information it needs to make sure that you know they're doing the job that they think that that that, that, that they're they're supposed to be doing. Um, but in more broad terms, than you know, this is how I want you to do it. It's more like this is what I want you to do. So in in the in the software development group, um, it's the difference between uh, you know a, a declarative language and and a um, what I'll what I'll call instructional language. So there, there's a better word, um, but you know the difference between uh, Python, where you have to tell each and every step of what you want the computer to do, versus something like SQL, which is just give me this data that fits this. I don't care how you get it. Just get it and give it to me. Something you've touched on that's really important here and, and sort of in what you're saying, I'm tying it back to, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations or decentralized um, governance in, in various kind of systems that we, that we look at and, and different kind of projects that we work with. So I guess for a bit more color, um, Michael Zagam, the founder of Block Science, kind of identified that the VSM is, you know, wildly relevant for DAOs. And we've got kind of a draft paper um, out there on this topic. But, you know, you spoke about like how, how does the system become efficient and effective? And it comes back to this question, which DAOs often ask, and I got kind of stuck with um, while doing some writing for the World Economic Forum sort of policy toolkit on DAOs or whatever, of what is good governance. And I think this model gives us kind of a key there when people are thinking about, you know, the design and operation of their own system and, you know, this idea of what is good governance. 
but there's clearly shared value across all scales of this organisation from the operations and the governance around what the purpose of the organisation is. And so that, you know, clarified or shared, you know, goal is still what each section is working towards and that helps create kind of structure with as least hierarchy as possible and sort of fit within this idea of an autonomous organization which I think is really important because uh, you know in the broader context of measurement there's a question about value as well and like like you know you want to measure what is valuable within the organization or the system, for example, but how do you determine that? Okay. Well, what is the purpose of, you know, the system? Well, where is that, you know, okay. In a DAO, like have, has a group uh, started with their, you know, with constituting the organization, like, is there a declarative thing? Is that, you know, formalized or implicit? Um, And all of these questions, which are actually quite uh, practical, you know, this is like just one sort of, tool in the toolkit or one sort of theoretical framework but you know something practical to kind of guide and orient you know the open slather of decentralized governance or measuring a complex system now the, the scientist in me always wants to answer a question that's been asked so my, my answer to that would be from a data perspective it's often important and I'm, I think I'm being conservative by using the word often it's just important to um, to to take the frequency of of what's going on into account. Um, so are there you know there, there are things that happen at a high frequency. There are things that happen at medium frequencies. There are things that happen at at low frequencies. Um, if you're an audio file, you've got a speaker designed specifically for each of those things, and you you don't want them to you know you want the crossovers to be just right so they don't get in each other's way. Um, there's a similar thing going on here. Operations happens at a very fast pace relative to everything else. Uh, and it's kind of answering uh, the how, uh, when, and where questions. Um, and then governance up here is, is more around the whys and the whats. And the whys you don't want to change very fast, otherwise people start getting confused. Um, and whats, um, you want them to only change as fast as they need to. Otherwise, you're just churning. Um, so, you know that that separation based on um, frequency of of, uh, of operation uh, of action, I think, is is probably one of the main reasons why this division is is so important. It would be really interesting if uh, if you could both provide because I think this framework and visualization are are, are very uh, helpful and I wonder if you would mind jumping into maybe a concrete example, uh, ideally one that y'all have explored at Block Science to kind of just help in, in case someone just heard all of that and they felt that was still a little too abstract for them uh, to maybe bring it down with some more specifics uh, of what it actually looked like when when working with an organization and trying to understand how uh, this mapping actually looks in, in real life, so to say. The example that we speak about uh, in that working paper by Zagam and I that's on uh, how principles in cybernetics apply to decentralized organization is a DAO called OneHive. And actually Zagam was involved uh, from quite early in the OneHive community because they adopted conviction voting, which is a mechanism for collective signaling of preference. But what we do is we kind of break down some of the core components of the governance in OneHive and we map that against the VSM. And we call that a constitutional model in that paper or, you know, kind of one way to, you know, achieve a viable decentralized autonomous organization is by, you know, observing this pattern where the organization has uh, that shared purpose and that is constituted. So, for example, in OneHive, they have a, a community constitution. Um, other DAOs, you know, will sometimes call that a manifesto. Um, some projects that have transitioned to becoming a DAO or exited to DAO, you know, have called that like their terms and conditions of the use of the platform, for example. 
Uh, but then coming back to One Hive, uh, what they then have as some of the other key pillars of their governance are conviction voting, which is around this uh, collective uh, signaling of preference, and that's how they pass proposals. So what they're governing here is their treasury or the allocation of resource towards the goal of funding open source software development. And that open source software is being applied within their own ecosystem. So it's a closed loop system, which is, you know, that kind of idea of an auton autonomous system is that it's, uh, you know, uh, politically independent and functionally independent as well. And so through conviction voting, there's this collective way for people to uh, put stake behind a proposal that they want to see funded. And then once that's passed, the working group that is granted that money is operationally autonomous. So they're still operating within uh, the broader goal of the system to build open source software, uh, but they can build that however with whoever they want. And then the accountability, the accountability or enforcement of that or where we see governance come back in to help uh, steer that system, I guess, uh, is in their use of Celeste, which is one tool which they have built to govern themselves. And it's a decentralized court. And so that has a whole policy process and a jury and semi-automated and so on. And you can look at the docs, um, which it's very well documented. Um, by, by their team and their internal wiki. Uh, but so, yeah, in the paper, we go through these different components of governance and how that works in practice and maps back to this idea, which David is um, sharing again in the VSM, of the various levels of governance that are doing the internal environmental scanning, the external, they're doing conflict resolution when needed, but until needed, uh, you know, functional units are operationally autonomous. So really, really, you know, not perfect. They're looking at a lot of stuff around accountability still. They've done a trial in retroactive funding, which uh, was positive. Uh, so this idea around um, measurement again and, and what they're kind of measuring within their own community is, you know, what is value? So in retrospect, when the community does a conviction vote on what has been built, what do people think was actually valuable when it was built? Uh, but yeah, that's that's one example I continually come back to again when, when people ask me as well, like, are there any DAOs that actually work? Um, I don't think it's perfect, but I think they've thought really carefully around uh, the social dynamics, community engagement, uh, the technical dynamics based on cybernetic principles uh, as a foundation and and created this kind of constitutional model or a way to operate autonomously. One point I can add to that is that the conviction voting that you mentioned um, is nicely um, tied to the idea of governance being a low frequency event. Um, it's specifically designed so that um, you stake um, tokens and the value of your stake increases over time. So it, 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 you can't, nothing happens, you know, quick too, too quickly. Um, it, it's, it, there's a, as, as, as Z likes to put it, there's a, there's a built-in low pass filter. And so I guess if, if kind of generalizing this and thinking about the nature of how block science broadly uh, works with kind of data and measurement overall, I mean, blockchains as opposed to other domains, I imagine offer an interesting amount of public data and uh, information to work with relative to more closed systems. So I wonder uh, if you two wouldn't mind kind of elucidating, uh, are there any unique opportunities here from that data and measurement side, given the fundamental nature of open ledgers and blockchains, uh, or is this kind of the same endeavor regardless of what industry you're looking in? Even in this, this, this open ledger, um, world, I've I've run into the same arguments of we don't want to share our data, so we're going to encrypt it. Um, but that that's I, I don't think that that you're ever going to get away from that. I mean, th there's information that that is is 
going to be kept proprietary regardless. Uh, but what 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 um, what the ledger does allow you to do is it 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 shows you the the dynamics of all of the interactions between at least addresses, um, so that you can go back and, and create effectively a temporal record of what went on. You can you can from that you can sort of build estimates of state at, at given points in time. So there is there, there is in this system a, a set of data that you can measure that, or that you can, you know, there's a set of measurements that you can turn into data um, that you can then go on and, and process and, and uh, create models with which to predict what's going to go on and make decisions based on that. Yeah, or evaluate what has happened as well. Like one really interesting area that we've been exploring as a team in some of our kind of open source research is uh, investigating the governance surface of these systems. And so we talk about that concept of the governance surface in the governance podcast episode in this series. Uh, but, you know, the boundaries uh, that set the, you know, the field of action of, of where, you know, governance is actually enacted or occurs. But projects can have, you know, a lot of ideas. You can read their constitution. You can talk to people, you know, about, like, what is your governance surface? How does governance work? What is possible? Who are the stakeholders? What actions can they take? But then the data scientists can actually go and look at that. They can look at the addresses and the actions that have occurred and, uh, you know, look at the smart contracts and look at the parameterization of governance within those and, you know, what is made possible and, you know, what is happening, um, you know, on chain or, or off chain or what is kind of becoming, you know, automated through, through smart contracts as well. Uh, and that's just been a fascinating uh, breakdown and I guess application of some of these methods in practice. And so I guess related to that, it'd also be really interesting to hear what are the kind of research questions that you all are exploring, uh, kind of building on this kind of data and knowledge that you are able to get? From just a data perspective, um, I think there, there's there's a lot of sort of basic work that needs to be done um, in terms of sort of classifying and categorizing entities based on, on, on their behaviors. Um, it, it's kind of where, where biology was in the in the you know, 17th, 18th century. Uh, just go out in a boat and, and, and observe a lot of stuff and write it down and come back and see what fits together. Um, and, and you know, I have a, I have an interest in in uh, you know good naming of things. Um, so developing sort of a a, a, a taxonomy, so to speak, or, or you know. You know we can try to get fancy and, and, and create sort of ontologies of, 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 of what's going on. Um, but those, those, you know, those can be formal representations that are important um, to get to the meaning behind or the, the meaning of the meaning that's in the data. Um, and keep, keep in mind that there's no magic in the data that comes off of a distributed ledger. It's still just bits. Um, it means nothing. It, it, it's the context in which that, that data exists that's important. Um, and so, you know, data isn't, isn't sufficient to make decisions on. Um, there's kind of a, an interesting meaning hierarchy that, that I use of, you know, data information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Um, wisdom is kind of highfalutin, so I usually substitute decision for it. Um, so you know, you, you know, you you can you can gather data, but unless you sort of understand what the data means, um, what its schema is, what what's what are the units, the the numbers were collected in, uh, you know, the types of data that are, that are involved, uh, it's no good to you. Um, and data comes from all different kinds of sources. So, you know, you, you need to create sort of coherent views of that data so that you can compare across different sources. So you're not comparing apples to, to oranges. You're, you're, you're comparing, you know, proper units. The, 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 the classic uh, 
fail that fail there was uh, I believe there was a, a Mars lander that crashed into the surface of Mars because one group was using English units and the other group was using met, uh, uh, metric units and the multiplication didn't work out right. Um, so, you know, you need to have those coherence of information in order for people to know what's going on. And then you sort of need to be able to communicate that knowledge among people so that they can share their different viewpoints. Uh, you know, the, 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 the blind people examining the elephant example fits into that. And then from that understanding, you know, you, hopefully you've got some kind of understanding before you make a decision as to what you're going to do next. So, you know, it's it, the, 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 that, that hierarchy is, is where my main interest is. How do you go from data to information to, to knowledge, to understanding, to wisdom? Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, one of my interests or one of the interests, I guess, across the team at Block Science is thinking about, you know, this concept which we're navigating collectively in real time of what is computer-aided governance and what is the role of, you know, computational mechanisms in that and what are the decisions being made and the assumptions, like David was saying, you know, what measurement units are you using and so on uh, in that and what are the uh, the human components or the, you know, hierarchies of um you know, decision-making authority and, and policy-making practices and so on. Uh, so I think that, you know, very broadly frames a lot of what we do as kind of a, a, a research direction and a, and a practice direction as well. Sort of one of the things that I personally find so interesting about block science is this kind of merging of looking at a topic like governance from so many different perspectives. And I really appreciate this conversation specifically, given how you two are kind of approaching the same kind of problems, but given very different backgrounds yourselves. And so I wonder... Um, and feel free to take this question in whichever direction feels more interesting for yourselves. But I, I'm interested both in, in the specifics of block science, kind of what does it take to bring together folks from, uh, you know, pure data, computer science, engineering, as well as, uh, you know, anthropology and humanities. And uh, if you don't mind sharing, what's in some of the secret sauce that you'll have there that that maximizes this kind of collaboration uh, or taken more abstractly, right? How do we just get more people from these very relevant but different disciplines collaborating together, given the importance uh, of, of, of having that collaboration for improving governance systems? I think it is happening. And I, I joined Block Science a year ago. And, and when I first joined, uh, it may have been naivete, but what struck me was um, the, there's this, this, this large body of knowledge that's been developed in the Web2 arena around uh, sort of horizontally scaling systems and efficiently computing using, uh, you know, what, I, what I'll call inefficient amounts of data, um, and 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 the the Web three uh, arena uh, was was not um, well um, set up to 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 allow for horizontal scaling. There was a lot of repetitive work that had to be done, and in order to do that quickly, you want bigger bigger faster machines and a lot of vertical scaling, that kind of thing. But in the in the last year, um, either um, I've just learned more about the arena, or there are more people coming in, who are who are seeing this as a problem and 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 and, and sort of giving some input uh, from from that area um, in, into the the Web three um, community. But as far as block science goes, in particular, I was interested in in joining the group. Um, largely because of the autonomy that I get as as a as a as a as a uh, senior engineer there, um, and and I think that that thing alone um, is sort of what attracts the breadth of experience that that block science has available to it. Yeah, I think at the meta level. You have to approach 
you know, this field, if we're talking about Web3 from an interdisciplinary perspective, you know, something is missing if you're just talking to engineers or you're just talking to social scientists. And so I think that is really attractive about, you know, actually cultivating an, an interdisciplinary team to look at these things. And, you know, I know for me personally, I'm constantly learning and trying to, you know, create and understand this, you know, shared vocabulary between even our own team to better conceptualize, you know, what computer aided governance means and how it's being practiced and all these things. And so, uh, you know, in the specific case of block science, there's really a cultivation of culture around that kind of mutual respect and mutual learnings from one another. And then it's, yeah, how do you get great people to, and let them work on the thing they want to work on. And sometimes that's uh, open research. Sometimes that's applied in projects and the kinds of projects range from, um, yeah, governance design, grant system design, um, governance evaluation. We've done stuff on, you know, DAO vulnerabilities and, um, and so on. So, uh, yeah, it's very broad, like there's, there's more, um, you know, need for, for research and system design than there are, you know, people to do it. So I think, um, yeah, it's a really open field for, uh, kind of play and experimentation and application and, and learning. And I think there's just a culture which aims to facilitate that as, as best we can, which, uh, thus far has attracted and retained some really, you know, fascinating and, and brilliant characters just to go do what they do best. Absolutely. And hopefully this, this mini series with block science will kind of both help elucidate some of the work that y'all are doing and the approaches towards it, but also serve as a point of kind of encouragement and a call to action of sorts of the importance of this interdisciplinary approach and some of the cool outcomes that can result when you, when you assemble the right interdisciplinary folks together. Um, but I realize we're getting uh, towards the end of our time. So I just want to give a chance for you to, to mention anything else that hasn't come up in the interview so far. Uh, but yeah, just really appreciative of you both taking some time to chat today. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that last point. Like there's so much more I could say about the people that we get to work with as well. Like in some senses, the organization has kind of porous borders because we're in orbit of, you know, these wonderful other teams and collaborators and, you know, like Scurf is one of them and Medigov and, um, uh, token engineering commons on the more kind of engineering side and so on these people that we sort of cross pollinate with and we're you know each involved in our own protocol communities or, or DAOs or whatever so I don't want to pretend that we're an island in, in any sense we're like an archipelago or whatever you know a, a constellation of islands that are all interlinked um, and then just to point out as well like there's like we could so easily speak for so much longer. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of this topic of measurement. Um, but yeah, if people are interested in um, data science in the Web3 and engineering kind of space, definitely reach out. You know, David is a wealth of knowledge and experience on actually, uh, you know, acquiring data from various sources and then the kind of processes that, you know, one would go through to, to process that data and surface insights in, in response to different research questions is, uh, yeah, such a fascinating area. So there's definitely a lot more there. Great. Well, thank you both again for, for taking the time to chat today. Uh, and yeah, just really appreciate the conversation and y'all taking the time.